Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone, um, to the broadcast and data session. Pleased to have John Dykes, a very familiar face um, and voice of football, English football in Asia. Um, really good to have you, John. Steve, very nice to be here. Uh, you mentioned the voice. Um, you might detect that at some point today the voice is a little bit scratchy. And um, I'm going to say I'm still feeling the effects of an uh, amazing weekend. It started very early on Saturday uh, when I did a Spartan race in what can only be described as a swamp uh, in Singapore. And it ended late on Sunday night when I hosted a, a, an outdoor live screening uh, of Manchester United Chelsea, which for some reason or other uh, ended up in me shouting a lot. Um, so that's my justification for having a bit of a scratchy voice today, Steve. Uh, and no comment on the performance during the Spartan race? Spartan race, uh, listen, you can go and look up the results if you want. All I know is I'm glad to have got through it, to be totally honest with you. But uh, I'm here, and it's great. Thank you so much to everybody for coming in. I think we'll have a few more uh, flooding in uh, in due course. I'd like to hope so anyway. Hopefully, yes. Um, I think, firstly, just before we get going into the body, talk about, obviously, your data journey, and we'll hear about data and how you got involved, and you've had a very long and illustrious career with football. How, how's that kind of came to life? Uh, okay, I mean, I'll try and keep it as brief as I can. I think the, the thing to point out is we all have different pathways to where we are. Uh, as a kid, I didn't just play all the sports. I just, I talked about them. I soaked it up all the time. I was always the one who knew what the scores were not just in the house games or anything like that, but in, in, in the, the first division, in the county championship, whatever it may have been. And so naturally I moved into a journalistic career. And as I moved into my journalistic career, these were very, very different times because when I started out as a sports reporter and then moved into sports broadcasting, back in those days, uh, data, um, stats, analytics, whatever you want to call it, they were the, the preserve of the geek they were the preserve of that bearded weirdo in the corner who had a copy of the Rothman's yearbook or some kind of an almanac because we didn't have the internet and it didn't exist. You know, this immediate availability of, of, of information just wasn't there. And so as a result, the way broadcasting evolved as I saw it was there was a, a privileged punditry position where you could only occupy that position if you'd played the game. That, that, was, that was the protected fenced off area and then the statistician was somebody you went to occasionally as a kind of a curiosity then everything changed Steve everything changed when data became available and at the same time journalistically my, my own journey took me into a position where I found myself more and more wanting to challenge I'd find myself sitting with pundits and the pundits might offer me something I found not satisfying why did that happen well because it did you wouldn't know you didn't play the game well that's not good enough for me because nowadays we can challenge that Nowadays, everyone out there has a stat. And whether you're just a fan, you know, we, we're all just fans. We, we check our fantasy teams. We look up numbers. We like to have that stat so we can zing our mates in the pub or wherever we're talking about the game. You know, we now have access to this information. So just lastly, a journey that took me to a position where I found myself building content, shaping editorial. I've always followed uh, a maxim that came from somebody. He was a, a former Australian cricket player, a uh, cricket captain, an absolutely brilliant one, and a great broadcaster called Richie Benno. And he, had, he said something that I was privileged to hear him say it live that stuck with me throughout my career. And he said, he was talking about being a commentator or a co-commentator. And he said, the secret to this, to being a great commentator, is to answer a question just as it's beginning to form in the viewer or the listener's mind. So what that means is be ahead of the curve, understand the sport that you're involved in, and understand where the viewer or the, or, or the listener is in that journey, i.e., is there a trend? Is there something happening here that we can identify, that we can then confirm, and we can use to entertain? So that sounds very serious and theoretical, but basically that underpins everything I do, because I now find myself, having been the guy that many of you will have seen for many years, being the guy who presents the Premier League football, which means live matches, highlights, moving pictures. For the last two years, I've been the guy who does it without any live pictures, no moving pictures, no rights access, uh, and I have to lean on my editorial now, really. Yeah, I think, you know, we're going to click, jump into a video that shows those people who aren't aware of how this show works, but it's a really kind of unique and innovative way that you're without rights without match action able to talk about create stories or commentate on stories around that and i think it's a really interesting point you know capability of you to do that all right in that case why don't we go to the video so i'd like to hope you've all seen it if you haven't uh, it's called the john dyke show three nights a week as you said on fox sports um and, and we can give you a taste of it right so first video please 
When it comes to the English game, the conversation never rests. Amazingly, it's now Guardiola who's having to play the mind games. You have to play football with a hard press. It would be a pivotal come the end of the season. To come back from that nasty injury, mm. you know, that's, that's going to take time. It feels like it's going to happen. Enjoy Eden Hazard whilst you can. Very good. Three nights what, a week. What, lots, of, lots of content hours in there with no, no match footage. There's lots to talk about. What did you take from that? Uh, what did you take from just the faces you saw there or what have you? Well, I, think, I think the interesting part is there's people commentating on what they know about. And one of the mo moments there was gossip. And the way you're able to use content and use data to actually back that up with facts and actually spark an invitation and a conversation about it as well. How's this one? Oh, okay. I'm back. Um, yeah, if you looked at that then, we had Jonathan Wilson, very high power football journalist. We had uh, a guy called Neil Atkinson, who does the Anfield Rap podcast. We had football legend Andy Cole. We had, we had a variety of different people there. But the show is not the traditional pundit driven show. It's, it's more to do with me setting an editorial agenda and saying, well, who's the appropriate person to comment on this? You'll also notice there's an awful lot of a use of headlines in there. And the use of the headlines is something that I feel very strongly about. I think in terms of digital news, we're at a very low ebb right now. Very low ebb. I think we're being given uh, a really, really bad procession of stories, headlines, rumors, dressed up as news. Um, because back in the day, before everybody was a citizen journalist, journalists were experts. Journalists knew about fact-checking, source attribution, getting things right, making sure that the rigors were applied. It's great that we can all have an opinion now. It's great that we can all share stuff now. But the problem is now, it's very easily manipulated. And as a result, I find myself challenging the headlines as much as I can. Just because something appears in a headline doesn't mean that there's truth there. If it appears in a headline, it might have been planted by an agent. I'm very much of the opinion that Jose Mourinho landed his last job because his agent and his network of people basically talked him into a job that the football club, Manchester United, initially weren't particularly keen to give to him. That's just an example of something that happens every day. Transfer rumors and gossip sustain so much of our, uh, our industry. Most of it is just speculation. Most of it is planted. So the point I'm going to make here is that if you're going to challenge what's in the news, you also have to challenge a lot that goes viral, a lot of the opinions and hunches and, 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 and vilification of certain players. Um, you look at someone like um, Young at Manchester United, absolutely vilified as a scapegoat for their recent problems. You know, things go viral, and suddenly you need to start going, whoa, 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 whoa. We need to look at the numbers here. We need some way of being able to quantify what we're talking about, which is where data, fortunately, steps in. Now, I can do this through a number of ways. What would you say is, in, in terms of what Opta contributes, I mean, you're, you're offering facts, you're offering analytics, yeah. different metrics. Context, you know, being able to contextualize what that stat was or why it's important compared to past and future as well. I think they're important. I think the other thing as well is that we have to recognize that the, the, the game has shifted in terms of the primacy of the pundit I spoke about earlier on. Now, don't get me wrong. Ex-players bring so much to certain conversations. I was working with Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank yesterday. He, he came on my show. And at one point, we did a little breakaway chat because my show doesn't just go on linear TV on, on, on Fox Sports three nights a week. We, we wrap social media around it because the key to my show is that I recognize that there is an informed, literate, eloquent, Asian football-loving audience out there that has opinions, that has knowledge, that wants to share them, that wants to be part of a progressive conversation. That's why the show exists. We wrap social media around it, we get in-show comment, we react to it, it's organic. It takes us across our different platforms, be they linear, digital, or social. It brings people in. Now, what we like to do is obviously do as much content as we can. So I asked Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank, one of the great Premier League strikers, a two-time Golden Boot winner in the Premier League, to ask I asked him about the best strikers, and we spoke about Sergio Aguero. He told me things about Sergio Aguero that none of us would have done. None of us, we have, none of us in this room, I think, are, 
Premier League strikers, are we? He told me about the positions he takes up, the movement he, he manages to do, the way when he's needed, he's in the box. When he's not needed, he can be doing something else. How, how he gets everything right, I, I don't think anyone else, even the most in-the-know hipster, would have been able to tell me that. So yeah, of course, there's a time and a place very much for the traditional pundit. But what we recognize is that there's the advent now of closing that gap, of bringing people who can bring something to this that maybe the pundits can't. Because I can tell you this, football players don't often watch football. They certainly don't watch as much football as we do. They don't get across the stats as much as we do. The old school pundits aren't as au fait with the things that we take for granted right now. You mention expected goals to some of them and they'll belt you. You know, and it's, it's, it's expected goals is something we'll talk about very soon. XG to those of us who are down with it, right? Um, let me give you an example of something that I think really captures where I am with this right now. The best football article I've read in a publication in months, if not years, came out recently in the Irish Times, written by a guy called Ken Early. E-A-R-L-Y. Go read it. Early, late, early. Ken Early, right? And what he did was he wrote a piece about the Manchester City, Manchester United game recently. But he did it about the broadcast by Sky Sports. Now, Sky Sports had Roy Keane in the studio as a pundit. You've probably seen the clips. Roy was brilliant, as he always is. He's very provocative. He's very aggressive. He's very angry all the time. And Roy was furious because, of course, City were just a class apart from Manchester United. They were dominating. And his big point was that the United players weren't getting close enough to the opposition. They weren't closing the gap. They weren't putting the physical effort in. They, they weren't shutting down. Gary Neville, who was on the show, who's very enlightened, obviously, you know, in terms of the ways of the modern game, tried, tried to make a point. No, no, he was shut up by Roy Keane. No, not having this. Would not accept in our day. We couldn't get away with that. And that was the point in our day. Now, Roy Keane was the best British midfielder, British and Irish midfielder 20, 20 years ago. Sitting next to him was Graeme Souness, the best British midfielder 40 years ago. The game has changed so much. Ken Early, in his article, basically pointed this out and said, what they don't realize is that football is a different game these days. And Ken Early used brilliantly data to support his argument. He said, look at the way Liverpool scored within seconds against Huddersfield the other day. The way they pressed the opposition, the positions they took up, the angles they took, the options they shut down, very similar to what was happening in the City United game. The United players might not have closed down because they knew if they lunge into that position, they're caught, they're in trouble. He said, passing. Ten years ago, Arsenal, who was still perceived, even though they were on the wane under Wenger, to be the best team at playing football the right way, they averaged the highest number of passes of any team in the Premier League. They averaged about 498 a game. Fast forward to now, and Manchester City routinely averaged about 740 passes a game. It's changed massively. If you get yourself in the wrong position, the ball's going to be passed around you very quickly as well because the game is faster. The reaction times are quicker. So there's that. Sustained spells of possession exist now that didn't exist 10 years ago. Teams like City have the ball forever and ever and ever. They wear you down with it. You don't get the ball. It's not a broken game. Number of tackles has decreased because the game doesn't break up as much. It's about transition. He made all of these points. He dragged out all of these stats, all this data. He talked about crossing. Crossing has gone away, apart from maybe fullbacks who get forward and put a ball in. You don't have wingers anymore. Numbers have dropped hugely. He used all of this, not on a personal attack on Roy Keane, to simply say the game has changed, which is why it was good to watch, but kind of embarrassing to watch a pundit say what he was saying. Now, this is where I think we try and arrive at with our editorial. Whether it's my show or broader programming, we're in a position now where we have to say to ourselves, not for the sake of it, not for being clever, clever, we want to use the data that is available to us in a way that we think informs the audience that is relevant to today's game. It's not good enough to have an old pro sitting there saying, none of you understand because you haven't played the game. And I think, you know, you've really highlighted there that journey of one piece of data that starts a conversation on a broadcast, moves into the next piece of content in the news, then moves into potential show that could go on social as well. But someone's had to get that story and understand it as well. And I think that's where you do that. How do you balance that opinion, fact, argument sometimes? Yeah, and that, that's, it's, it's a great question there because what you do is it's all very well knowing where to find data, but you, you, you've, got to, you've got to know what to look for, how to look for it, and then how to use it. 
that's, that's the other thing as well. I mean, I always tell the story that when I was first working at the Premier League channel, uh, a very well-meaning executive producer came up to me about an hour before I was about to go on air for an eight-hour broadcast featuring three live matches back to back to back. And he whacked down on the table a wad of, 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 of preview stats about that thick and said, I think you'll be needing that. <laughs> I sort of said, well, thanks. I need about that much of it, and I needed it five days ago because there's no point in, in immersing yourself in tons and tons of stuff. You need to learn what you need to know specific to that particular task. It's good to have background knowledge, but you need to know what you need. Let's lighten it up a bit. Let's talk about Duncan Alexander, shall we? Yeah. So obviously, yeah, one of the things uh, we were going to talk about is overcoming the limited rights access or no rights access and how you can use data to create stories and obviously Duncan's a great example been on the show now and how did that kind of come to life and for you you know you use it and use it well right well this is the thing yeah okay Twitter we're all on Twitter or at least most of us are I'm sure here uh Opta Joe who's aware of Opta Opta Joe Opta Juan Opta everybody right you know what the deal is there who's aware of at oily sailor as a as a tag well, that's a guy called Duncan Alexander, who he's got such a long title, I never use the whole thing. Basically, he is the guy who leads the editorial, who innovates for Opta, who, who, who takes stuff and, and just gets it out there into the editorial world. Um, let, let's play a clip, shall we? Yeah? yeah? All right, second clip, please. I think from that point on, there were a couple of fairly straightforward ones that I'll draw your attention to, because England did concede fairly quickly afterwards and conceded again, uh, and that prompted this one. Very much factual, this one here, okay. Conceded more than once in the first half for the first time since June 2017. Standard fare. That yeah, way. I mean, often during a game, you just have to kind of react to what's going on. And yeah, yeah that was pretty standard, yeah. Now, we come to the end of it. So, with the goal disallowed, they ended up losing the game. So, 24. Their first competitive game they've lost at Wembley since November 2007. Ending a run of 24 games without defeat in competitive action. I just take issue with Pipped. You didn't come up with Pipped. I don't well, know what it means. Well, I was on the plane over here uh, when that went out, so I don't, I don't know what they meant, actually. I mean, I'd have probably gone with Umbrella, because if you remember, November 20 2007 mm. was the Steve McLaren game when it rained very heavily and England lost a, a key game. I'd have gone with Shower. Very good double meaning. Like there you that. go. Yeah. There you go. Anyway, the, the tall guy, Duncan Alexander, uh, the guy talking too much is always me. Um, but the thing that, about that clip, is not much about the clip. The point about that one is that through using tweets, through using tweets, uh, he is so good at it. He's almost like a haiku, you know, the way he's able to use words. He'll take a piece of data, he'll make a point, he'll use a seemingly throwaway pun or a little quip, but actually lead to a really great little wormhole that you can go through in terms of exploring a point. And, th and that's something that's really important to you guys, isn't it? Yeah, I think within data, data's data wherever you use it. And the challenge sometimes is you see the reams of information. How can you give that contextual, insightful, informative piece of information in 140 characters? And I think that was our turning point to go, well, actually, data on its own, you've got to do something with it. And then, you know, the conversations that it can spur from that for you. Well, absolutely. So in a moment, we're going to show another clip where we go a little bit deeper in terms of using data. But one thing I'd like to say about Duncan is that he has a, a journalistic rigor to what he does. It might all seem very fun and throwaway and flippant, but just the other day, he, he taught me a little bit of a lesson because I got caught in a piece of uh, data manipulation myself. Now, you might remember Manchester United City. I mentioned the game earlier on. Ahead of the game, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer came out and accused Manchester City of being tactical foulers, of being a team that tactically fouls and, and, and is the worst in the business at it. Pep Guardiola was furious when confronted by this accusation uh, in his pre-match press conference. And in fact, what happened after that was Manchester City's media team fed, drip fed to the media stats. And these stats that they gave them were ones that said that United had committed nearly the most fouls in the league. City were at the bottom of that table. Uh, on average, uh, six or seven United players a game were right near the top of the fouling charts. They had more yellow cards, blah, 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 blah. So the headlines the next day were, Pep's right. His team plays clean. His team's good. And I ran those headlines on my show. And Duncan happened to be on the show that night. And he said, yeah, no, no, no. He said, but you haven't gone deep enough into the data. And I said, well, there's three graphics there showing you all this. And he said, but no, no, look at the one that tells you how much happens when City are in possession of the ball and how much happens when they're out of it. City will have the ball for a lot, a lot of the time. They're not fouling because they've got the ball. When they haven't got the ball, they foul more than anyone. And those, those stats are out there. They might not have six or seven players, but they've got two or three who are right up there, whose job is the minute the possession is lost, commit a foul. So... He said, the manipulation of the data there was so good that it took me in, 
and got to the point where we had to look a little bit deeper. And, and that's, I think, something that all of us have to be conscious of because it's, very, it's a broader problem. I'm not going to go Donald Trump on you and talk about fake news, but it is a broader problem in terms of the media and the way data is presented and manipulated. Let's, let's have another look at Duncan, shall we? Because I think there's another clip we can run which shows another way in which we can go a little bit deeper with the data available to us. So can we run the third video, thanks? Um, in terms of, uh, up to Joe tweeting as well here, uh, 395, uh, only the three teams currently in the relegation zone have been behind in matches in the Premier League this season for longer than Manchester United. Stats. Thank you up to Joe there. Thank you up to as ever for ramming home the point. These, are, these aren't just stats. These are astonishingly bad stats. Are you surprised at these numbers, yeah. Duncan? Yeah, I mean, you can't really ignore them. They, you know, they are indicative of how much United are struggling. I mean, even their kind of good results recently have come from coming back from behind and, and snatching wins where it looked like they were going to lose. And I think, um, you know, it's just that, and as we're going to go on to talk about, you know, the rest of the league, the top sides are doing so well that they're just falling further and further behind. And it, mm. you know, there doesn't seem to be any kind of progress. I think that's what's most frustrating for Manchester United fans is that, you know, last season they, they came second, yes, but that was mainly down to David De Gea having one of the all time great seasons. He's now regressed back to, you know, a normal level for a goalkeeper. Mm. Um, and suddenly, you know, the, you know the, their league position reflects that. Now, <laughs> at the risk of patting myself on the back, the key to that little clip there was that that happens towards the end of Mourinho's uh, ill-fated reign at Old Trafford. So the stats that we were getting out there were trying to make sense of what on earth was going on at that football club. But in a way, it was very prescient because as you saw then, we were talking about David De Gea. And we all know what's happened with his form. I think fully understandably, given the pressure he's been under recently. But the key to this show is... In the absence of footage, we have to make sure that the content editorially is spot on. And if back, and remember Mourinho lost his job on what, 20th of December or something like that. If back then we were able to put something out there that funnily enough echoes true today about De Gea being a bit of a problem for them right now, then, then I'm proud that we've, we've done our job as well as we can there really. Yeah, and I think you highlight that point there around being able to create content with no match action, using informed analysis and, and very simple data. It's not complicated, it's very, but it gives a lot of insight and gives a lot of story. And like you say, it was reacting to a new story at the time, but actually gave content that was right. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I mean, it'd be great if we were Premier League rights holders and we could show every single highlight and every goal and we could also do shows like this on top of it. But we're not right now. So I make a show that doesn't feature the footage. But what I can do is in this day and age, I can assume knowledge. I can assume we've all seen either live or elsewhere, by whatever means, we've seen the clips, we've seen the action, we know the controversy. So I'm able to make the assumption that we've now moved on. We're looking at where this story goes. What's the next step? What do you guys need to know? Who's pulling the wool over your eyes? Where are we in this conversation right now? And I think that's hugely important. Now, the other thing, of course, when you're making a show like that, Steve, and this is a problem, is we get stuck a little bit with visual sources. A bit of grainy Skype, which breaks down quite often, by the way. I mean, it's not infallible, is it, Skype? So we have to make do with that. I have to do the best I can with newspaper headlines, still pictures, graphics, what have you. It's important that we can come up with something, which is where our friends here help us out massively. Because Opta don't just give us dry black and white numbers on a piece of paper. They give us tools that we can use visually as well that really make a point. So I think it's a good time to go for that, that last video clip, yeah? So we run the fourth clip, please. Let's have a little look at where this story goes next, because I think that's the key to that. We've looked at what people are doing away from home, and the next thing we have to do is talk about where games are won. Yeah. Well, where games are won, old heads. 59 minutes in, a game that I think Southampton are winning. Not just drawing, I think they're going to win that game until Klopp sends on Henderson and Milner. Right, look at Henderson, what do you do? Oh, coach's dream, coach's dream. Give him a job and he sticks to it without question. Absolutely fantastic. Liverpool, under the cosh. Trent Alexander-Arnold was under some real pressure. Mm. You stick him on. And Henderson really backs him up. Yeah, there's the goal. There's the goal touch there. It was three touches in total inside the opposition's 18-yard box. Look where they did the work. Box. Henderson and Milner. 59%. Just mm. really plugging that gap there, giving his side a chance to not only get back in the game, but go on and win it. We're going to have a look at um, Milner's heat map as well, Mark. But um, the thing about this was Klopp just did what was needed. He sent on somebody who could stick the boot in, get into a game that was slipping away. They weren't winning tackles. They were losing 50-50s. And suddenly the old stages did the job, didn't they? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, talks, it tells you a lot about bringing on that experienced player, Premier League mm. experience, James Milner, what a, what a professional he is. 
um, phenomenal player in terms of versatility um, and exactly what Liverpool need. I mean, Liverpool are not playing great football. However, their resilience, mm. their determination, um, dealing with the pressure has been incredible. Um, Southampton, on the other hand, you know, poor. That's why they are where they are. Didn't take their chances. Um, Shane Long takes that chance, makes it 2 0. I think it's very, very difficult for Liverpool to get back in the game. However, Liverpool seized it, seized the mm. moment, took their mm. chances, and that and Salah back to scoring ways again. What a finish. So there we go, Steve. I mean, that really sums up what we do with the show right now. We've got a, a brilliant Premier League player in Mark Schwarzer at the end of a Skype line. We've got John Wilkinson, my partner in punditry, who's an ex-pro who knows his way around what happens in games. We've got the sources that we need. And thanks to Opta, we've got some moving images. You know, we can take a story of a goal. We can see a pass progression. I might not be able to show you the video, but I can show you arrows that move. I can get heat maps. I can get the story of somebody's game because they have the tools. And, and, and we're really only scraping the, you know, the, 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 the tip of things there because actually they've got far more advanced and sophisticated visual tools that uh, people can use as well. Hugely important that we have that because we have to be mindful that you know, we can't just put a boring, flat bunch of numbers on screen. We need it to be visually stimulating. We need the camera to move around a bit. We need something to really appeal to the eye as well. So that's, that's hugely important for us. I think obviously we've, they've stepped up the, the depth of the data there from, from a simple fact or a tweet, moving into heat maps and things. You know, there's, there's a level of knowledge and it's important that you guys are able to articulate quickly what that means as well to the audience. Yeah, I mean, that was a significant one. I mean, it was one of those games and there have been so many games lately where Liverpool have been desperate to keep pace with Manchester City and it looked at Southampton as if it wasn't going to happen and then bang, on about the hour mark, double substitution and Klopp sent on Henderson and Milner. Now, in the absence of footage, we had to find a way to explain why that was so significant. And thanks to the, the, the Opta data that we had, thanks to our own football knowledge, we were able to make the point about what happened on that football pitch. And we had the tools at our disposal to do it. Hugely important for us. Now, I mentioned expected goals earlier on. I just want to say one thing here about this. I, I've been talking to panels for a year and a half, two years now on this. And who's aware of XG uh, and, and what XG is, right? Yeah, a few hands go up there. I'll paraphrase, XG basically is, is a metric that is able to show us in football matches when chances occur, the likelihood that that chance is going to be converted. I'm simplifying massively here. You know, you're in a certain part of the pitch, opportunity comes for a header or a shot or what have you from this angle, this far out. How many times in 10 or how many times in 100 would that be converted? The reason that's such an important metric initially, as I said, you might sit opposite a pundit Ball goes to the far post, somebody has a go, goes wide. Pundit sits there and says, he'll be disappointed with himself there. Well, will he? Will he really? I mean, you know, the, the, the ball was almost behind him, it's coming here. I wonder how many times out of 10 someone would really convert that chance. XG tells us. XG tells us. So the way we use XG, and we've got XA for expected assist as well, tells us in certain matches, and of course over a period of matches, whether a team is over or underachieving. And... We've spoken about this in the past, but this season has given us the perfect vindication, not that it was needed, of the XG metric. And that vindication comes in the shape of Manchester United. You have a club that underperformed under Jose Mourinho, brought in Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, to everybody's surprise, who then produced the most dazzlingly, record-breakingly good performances, results at least anyway. Then, bipolar in the extreme, going completely the opposite way. Staggeringly bad run of form, worst in decades, worst in all this time and what have you. Now, of course, traditionally what we would do is we would lash out, wouldn't we? Well, it's the players to blame. It's the manager. Solskjaer doesn't know what he's doing. It's because we've forgotten that he did brilliantly when he first got there. It's the board. Blame the board. It's Pogba and all of his Instagram. Yeah, you know what, we do that. But what we've got is in the shape of XG, we've got a very calming influence because we can go, no, 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 no. All that happened was they were massively overperforming, then they were underperforming. What they've done is they've actually regressed to the mean. They've regressed to the mean that tells us the Manchester United actually are the sixth best team in the country. That's it. That's all that's happened really here. And, and, and having that at your disposal takes away some of the hysteria from, from, from what goes on around the story sometimes. And I think it also brings it back down to a common piece of information that everyone can talk about rather than say you know opinion and fact and this and that it's kind of coming back to an actual 
point that everyone can relate to. Absolutely. And what I'd like to see, I mean, you know, one of the things that Opta do is they're always pushing the boundaries. There's always innovation, innovation in terms of metrics and what have you. They're working hard on things like um, uh, sequences of play on, 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 on possession. And I've spoken about this a few times. Now, I find it fascinating editorially to understand, you know, about transition and which teams do that well. And, you know, it gets a bit technical and football -y, but I think this is important. On the expected goals, for instance, I would like to be able to go even deeper. I would like to say if that chance in that position falls to that player based on his or her history, how many times would they convert it? Then I'd like to really know whether that person will feel that I should have scored that or I shouldn't have scored. You know, there's, there, there, there's exponentially just about any way you can go with this and, and it would take an awful lot of work, I know. And you started out doing that, didn't you, in terms of you know, the analysis of things? Yeah, I think, and you know, as we've got to these new metrics that start to become a little bit more complicated than a shot on goal, which everyone can understand. You start talking about XG and sequence and possession. I guess the question for you is, th that's, a, that's a slightly complicated, more complicated solution. What role is the broadcaster in educating to bring that type of content through as well? Or is, is it everyone's responsibility? Well, I think it's hugely important. I mean, you know, okay, we're, we're using that to try and explain results. Because, of course, the one thing that we do here, and, and, and let's not you know, forget that there's a massive gambling audience, when something happens that we don't expect, I don't know whether you say here in Singapore, they go, oh, okay, long, fixed, must be fixed. Can't, can't, can't process this. <laughs> well, now we have tools that enable us to go, yeah, yeah, we can process this. This happened because of that metric. You know, it, it, it's, it's something that we can put into numbers and we can analyze. I think in the same way, we have to understand that we need to be able to rationalize things. I was watching that game the other night, the Manchester City game, of course, against Burnley, and it came down to fine margins. I was actually sitting next to somebody who turned around when, when, when the, the GDS decision awarded the goal and said, oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> How can you not be sure? It, it, it is the one, the one metric that cannot be argued with. GDS cannot be wrong. It simply cannot. The technology exists in such a way that you do know definitively, even if it's just millimeters, whether or not that ball has crossed that line. You cannot argue with it, but we're conditioned to argue with it because VAR has got us in that state right now. And in my opinion, the way UEFA has got two different ways of interpreting VAR is really not helping. In-game, one thing. As soon as you go to VAR, different thing. Handball, everything's a handball in the box right now. That's why wherever we can use data to help us out, it's important. Um, look, that's it. That's the show. It's what we do. It's how we build a show using editorial insights, the tools that these guys make available to us. I don't know if you guys have got anything to, to ask. I'd love to, to answer any questions if uh, possible. I think we've got a bit of time left to us, haven't we? And there's one or two microphones out there. So if, if, if there's a chance of getting a microphone to anyone who might put their hand up. I've worked in Asia long enough to know that as soon as you invite questions from the floor, there's a Stunned silence, but uh, come on, feel free. We will be around at the, at the back of the room afterwards anyway to answer questions if you're shy, but I'd love to have someone throw a question at me from the floor with or without Mike. Yep, there's one. Okay, John, how has, I don't know, your broadcasting developed, I don't know, through the stats changed from, say, 20 years ago when you didn't have all that Opta data? Well, yeah, I mean... It's tempting to say it's all for the better, but I think sometimes we have to be careful not to get too buried in stats, because what we must remember is that we are essentially still broadcasting and we're still trying to, 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 to bring the immediacy, the engagement, the visual you know, attractiveness of, of, of what happens on the pitch to life. But it's just good to have that. It's good to have that to back that up, because I don't think nowadays you can pull the wool over the audience's eyes. In the past, you could say, this guy here, knows a bit about the game, take it from him. He knows what's what. Well, now, I don't think that's good enough. Now I think that you're all well enough informed, knowledgeable about football and what have you, to be able to turn around and go, I question that. And as a broadcaster, the key to it is you must never, ever let a member of your broadcast team be isolated or be inadequate. So even if someone comes to me, and I'm, I'm sensing that they don't quite have enough knowledge, they haven't watched the games enough, I will feed them the information. There is nothing worse than a presenter who hangs someone out to dry by actually being a bit of a show off and saying, well, I know all this stuff, that famous ex-player doesn't. That doesn't serve any purpose. That's, that's appalling because you are part of a broadcast team. So what you must always do is make sure that you have the answers, but it's not acceptable, I think, to, to not have it. What's good about it now, to answer your question long-windedly, is that it gives us the tool now to make sure the broadcast is better. It's not good enough anymore to go on a hunch, I don't think. I think also the other part that's changed is the pace. 
So previously, you know, performance analysis and data has been around for 50 years, but it was pen and paper. The, t the pace at which it's evolved and the, the pace at which we can get it on air or to a talent to get on air is what's changed significantly. There's depth of data, yes, but fundamentally the pace and the ability to mine huge data sets quickly and articulately and feed that back. I think the other thing as well is let's accept now that nobody sits and watches a screen, one screen anymore, do they? Nobody does. I mean, my case would be screen with the game on, laptop with my fantasy team on, phone with... Uh, social media, WhatsApp group, whatever it may be, you know, chat group going on, what have you. I met a guy the other day, this is an extreme example. He used to be someone who, he is someone, he used to run bars and restaurants, which meant that every Saturday night he'd have screens all over the place. He was surrounded by this. Now he doesn't anymore. And he's, he, he doesn't watch the game live, but he does, but just not with the moving pictures. He says he has a stat page open. He has Twitter on the go. He has his fantasy on. And that satisfies him. He watches the progress. It's almost like watching a cricket via an over by over or something like that, rather than actually watching the game itself. Bizarre, but he said he's just happy to do that right now. So any more questions on that or anything else? Far away, one at the back. John, I've been a big fan for 20 years. So this Thank question... You. Thank you for making me feel very old. <laughs> okay, uh, so my question is, and I missed the beginning of your talk, so you may have covered it. Do you see the scouting system changing with data? Because it seems to be not so informed by data currently. Um, well, you, maybe, maybe not. I mean, if you look at Fulham Football Club as a classic example here, um, Fulham Football Club have had two cracks at the Premier League recently. Um, by recently, I mean under the ownership of uh, Shahid Khan, all right, of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, his son, Tony Khan, has been involved in Fulham in both of those attempts at Premier League um, campaigns. Uh, he is a devotee of Moneyball. Uh, he's a football manager player. Uh, I have it on good authority because I know people at that football club. Uh, very often they find themselves in the transfer market and they're presented, for example, with somebody who has Premier League experience, who would come for a good price, who has experienced relegation dogfights before, and instead they go and sign somebody whose numbers look fantastic on Football Manager, maybe a, a Greek uh, centre forward who's never played outside of Greece with an injured knee or something like that. That has happened. I, I, I'm not doing this to disparage them specifically, but what I'm saying is that there has been uh, at times a tendency to, to do that, to go down that route, rather than combine it with knowledge of people within the game who are able to, 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 to do more. But Steve will be able to say more. I obviously use Opta Tools from an editorial perspective. Of course, there are massive applications in terms of within the game itself. Yeah, I think um, it depends is the answer. That there's some teams, some regions that are much further down the road on that process. Um, you know, you look at some teams, they buy every single piece of data that we've got and mine that and look at trends and compare it to past players. Is this going to fit our system? Styles of play starting to come into effect as well. There's others. Does the agent sell a good story? Is he got market value? Is he going to sell a load of shirts and fill my stadium? It really varies. There is a lot of movement towards, you know, Moneyball obviously was the one that's kind of brought this to the fore. Things like that were going on for a long time. But it does vary, and it's very different case by case. Even within the same league, half the teams will be doing one thing, half will do another. But I think John's right. The, the data can only serve one purpose. It then comes down to football and possession and styles of play. And will that person fit in as well, as well as the other stuff as well? So. I think as with anything, context. Context is everything. You can't just take data in isolation. You need it interpreted. And that's why data analysis is, is, is the key to all of this. Any more? Any more questions? Yep, down the front. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yes, John, I'd like to uh, get your opinion on uh, the danger of dehumanizing the game. Uh, we've seen, you've explained uh, brilliantly the use of data and how it's enhanced coverage. But in the future, and I'm particularly thinking of VAR here, isn't there a danger of the fan not knowing what is going on? I'm thinking particularly of VAR. Fans in the stadium are blocked from knowing. We see it on TV at home. But the fans can sit there for five minutes and not know what is going on. It's a very good point. It's actually a systemic flaw 
it's, it's a massive systemic flaw because what's happening now, you're right, is that they're not seeing it and they're getting texts from people at home who are saying this is what's going on. This is what they're looking at right now. It is nonsensical that that should happen. If you're going to bring this in, now I spoke about GDS. GDS cannot be faulted. It, it, it deals with absolutes. I personally think that you should only bring in video technology to deal with absolutes, not matters of interpretation. Because if you're dealing with matters of interpretation, if the laws aren't properly written, and look, they're rewriting uh, handball right now, they're rewriting as many as they can to try and make them a little bit more clear, uh, I think you're going to have a problem. But that is a ridiculous uh, situation. If you're not showing uh, images within the stadium because you're worried about incitement, which has always been the reason why you don't see tackles and you don't see controversial moments, you are denying the live audience which is a huge part of any football match, uh, something fundamental to it. So I think that, plus the fact that you've got to show every angle. I mean, very famously, of course, we saw a goal recently that went in off elbow, hip, goal. Very important goal that went in there. And uh, Lorente scored that one, of course. Um, you have to have every angle available, and you, may, you must make sure that everyone in the stadium can see it as well. But I, I, Michel Platini, I interviewed him once and asked him about this many, many years ago, and he said, it is not in the nature of the game to stop and do what we're being asked to do with uh, video technology. He, he would have said, don't use anything apart from goal line technology, and I, I kind of understand that. At the moment, for example, linesmen or lines people, assistant referees, are being told to be very loose in their judgments, to let stuff go, because the instruction is, let it go to VAR. It's a very dangerous precedent to set, because a bit like cricket umpires, who used to be so finely attuned that they could spot anything that happened, they started then to question themselves, because they leaned on technology in the same way that maybe we lean on sat-nav in the car, when actually we should be perfectly capable of looking at a map, working out a route and getting there ourselves. And I think it's a dangerous path to go down, to be honest with you, and it has dehumanized sport, which is a human activity, after all. And that's all we've got time for. Um, really big thanks, John. Very open, very insightful. And um, as John said, we'll kind of hang around at the back if anyone's got any other questions they want to approach us. But thank you.